say this every show. I always have outstanding guests. And this week is no different, but I got a feeling this is going to be a conversation that's going to be really, really amazing. Uh, I have Mr. Gerald uh, Moore Sr. He is the founder of Mission um, Fulfilled 2030, and he's going to have to explain to me exactly what that means. He is a STEM advocate for boys, and y'all know I have sons. He is a technology educator, a youth sports trainer, and he is a cyber security engineer. So, you know, this man is heavy. He, he has all balls blazing. So I'm excited to have him on the show. I am honored and I am blessed. So, uh, Gerald, will you please say hello to our guest and tell them a little bit about yourself. First and foremost, Dr. Payton, thank you for having me on your show. I sincerely appreciate it. I think it's an awesome thing that you're doing, exposing, getting exposure to minorities and tech and STEM. So I think it's an awesome thing that you're doing. Um, I'm Gerald A. Moore Sr., and I'm the founder of Mission Fulfilled 2030. And you asked, what is Mission Fulfilled 2030? Well, Mission Fulfilled 2030 is a nonprofit organization I've launched to inspire, educate, and activate young black males in tech and STEM. And the grand vision is to impact 100,000 boys by 2030 and get them on track to be in the STEM field um, in a variety of digital and high-tech high tech, uh, visible opportunities. And we do that by creating tech and STEM programs that are led by black males. And the mission fulfilled 2030 is past tense because in my mind, it's already done. I've already done this. I've already seen the vision. Now all I have to do is go into action and make it happen. And, um, you know, it started from just me having an opportunity to participate in tech and STEM that like a lot of young black males that go up in the inner city, I probably would not have had this opportunity if it wasn't for some things that were put into place that I'm sure that we'll, we'll discuss during this interview. <laughs> but um, Mission Fulfilled is our nonprofit organization. We have a grand vision, inspire, educate, and activate 100,000 young black males in tech and STEM. I mean, and I, I, mean I love that, that thought, that concept, because as we said earlier in our conversation, we have a lot of women going in. There's a lot of money uh, getting us there. But uh, our young men, and this is young men across the board, black, white, Hispanic, are going into college at a far lower rate than women. And that affects the uh, number, of, number of them also going into STEM. Now, have you always been interested in STEM or can you give us a brief synopsis of your journey into so, getting here. When um, when I was a kid, my friends used to call me the destructor, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I'd like to see what was inside of stuff. Now, me and you, we can go back and you remember, you know, the big box televisions that we had, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anytime one of those TVs was set out on the curb <laughs> and I got a chance to see it, like I needed to get in it. I would take the tubes out and all that stuff, break them on the street. I was just being bad at that point. But everything that I had, every electronic device that I had as a child, I had to open, right? I think that was my first exposure. And I think I got there because my father and my uncles were builders. Oh, okay. Right? They were builders. Like my father worked on cars. My uncles worked on cars. They hung drywall. They did anything like anything like they could do it so I think I kind of got the bug there just in them just being kind of handymen mm -hmm. and again every electronic device I had I had to open it and I remember and I, I tell the story on occasion I got the worst spanking of my life at about 10 years old my mother bought me a radio and she came in my room and saw that thing all taken apart on my dresser now, she spanked my tail. The next day, 
she comes in my room. I'm getting prepared for school. She hears the music playing, and she comes in the room. She sees the radio all back put together and had a meltdown because it wasn't until then she thought I was just destroying stuff. Yeah. But I had this inqu inquisitive thing about me with with technology. Now, for that radio, I needed to see how you turn the dial and the station change. Mm -hmm. I, when I put that tape in the deck, how is this thin piece of tape transferring that music back and forth? How does that happen? So in my mind, I needed to know how that worked. The only way to do it was to take apart the radio. Yeah. Now, most of the stuff I took apart, like my mother would see me taking stuff apart. She never saw me put it back together. Right. So she didn't put one and she just thought I was destroying stuff. But it was that moment where she realized who I was as a person. Right. In relation to why I was taking stuff apart. And it's not just he's destroying stuff like he's actually good at this. Like I'm actually good at that. And then that just led to me as a teenager. I got into music and installing car stereos for people in my neighborhood and stuff like that. So, you know, I just was kind of always into it. So, but okay. that was my start. And, you know, think about it now, you know, several years later, you don't see kids don't take things apart anymore. No. So everything we buy now is expendable. If you buy a toaster, I remember taking the toaster to the shop and the, the little man fixing it, cleaning the coils, cleaning it up, charging you like five or six dollars and right. giving it back to you or repairing the microwave uh, when they broke. Or, I mean, if you've ever had a TV man come out to your house because the TV right. stopped working, uh, because those things back then were extremely expensive. Now, mm -hmm. if the TV breaks, you toss right another trash pile and go buy another one. Right. So we don't have those things anymore. Yeah, and a lot of the, the trades were taken out of the schools. Yeah. So the majority of our schools don't have trades and you know, I think that's important, especially for black males, right? Yeah. You know, being able to do things with your hands. And um, I think that's a lost art that we're definitely trying to bring back with Mission Fulfilled 2030 because the plumber is a STEM, you know, the plumber, oh, plumber, yeah. plumber that's oh, a STEM yeah. job, right? It's all about math and, and all those in math and science and chemistry and physics. That's what plumbing is, right? But we deter kids from that, oh, it's a dirty job. It's probably one of the best jobs that you can have as far as income without going to college. Yeah. Like, so it's a great opportunity. And I think that, you know, in, in taking those skill trades out and we and devaluing those trades is really yep. doing our community a disservice, especially with our electricians and our plumbers and, and all of the skill trades. And I mean, uh, I was listening to the news last week in my car and they were saying how short, short we are of those trades right now. Absolutely. Look at everything that has happened with um, the situation that we're in now, especially here in Texas, when we had all of these ice storms and uh, people have had to get plumbing fixed, drywall fixed, flooring fixed. And a lot of people are still waiting to get Absolutely. things done. And I mean, they're just waiting because they, we don't have the tradesmen out there to do it. And, and then especially, especially mm -hmm. in the black community, mm -hmm. that's what keeps our community going. Those people who have those trades to where we can circulate our value in our communities by mm -hmm. not having to go outside of our communities to bring people in and mm -hmm. take money away. Right. We can. You know, have those fun. We always, back in the day, we always had those people in our communities. I remember my dad wasn't an electrician. He also wasn't a plumber. He also, you know, he kind of did everything. But when stuff happened in the community, I remember him going to people's houses and doing their plumbing and doing, you know, everything kind of happened in our community, right? Yeah. If, if there was something my dad couldn't do, he knew somebody in our community who could come help him do it and we just we're so far away from that in relation to our skill trades especially in black communities and we definitely have to inspire some young black males to get back into it and, and that's what we're about that's what mission fulfilled is about that's a lot of what i'm about i love the digital high-tech stuff oh, but yeah. also 
you know, also just just going back to the basics. Like I'm always building. Like my my sons get mad at me. Dad, I don't want to get out here. You're gonna learn how to use the saw. You're gonna learn how to use a screwdriver. You would be surprised how many kids can't even handle a basic screwdriver. <laughs> when I was teaching physics, I would bring my tool, my power tools to school. You know, my drills, my saws. Uh, and we were building like trebuchets and all different kind of stuff. And the principal was like, if somebody gets hurt, uh, you know, you're going to have to deal with it. Nobody got hurt. Right. We had a blast. Uh, if they got hurt, I didn't know about it because right. they, they knew if, if they did, we couldn't do stuff like this anymore. But we were always building something in physics to test for speed and direction and force and because the school that I was at we didn't get I mean back then you know early 2000s you didn't have all that automated computer stuff right. to, to calculate for that most of that was on the college campus now every uh, student computer at my old yep. school you know has a, a, a program that they can calculate for all of that yep. but we had to do it but before I get into uh, Mission Fulfilled 2030, you are a author with a book on Amazon's best selling best sellers list. I want to yes. talk about that first because I'm an author too. So, but I write children's books. Hold your book up. I want to see it. <laughs> thank so you, I wrote thank this you. book. I wrote this book um, back in. 2019, okay. 2019, and one of the reasons I wrote the book was um, in 2019 I was selected by Black Enterprise as a, a BE Modern this um, thing they have BE Modern Man, where okay. they select a hundred Black men each year who are doing good work in their communities to kind of showcase us, and I made that out of 15,000 applicants. So I make Black Enterprise Modern Man, and um, one of my good friends said to me, he was like, you know, man, you're the thought leader on how to come from the hood and become an engineer. Mm -hmm. And because I wasn't a good student, like I wasn't a good student, like I grad my high school GPA when I graduated was a 1.69. So I graduated with a D average and people will always ask me, well, how did you become an engineer? How did you get to work for that big six consulting firm with that GPA? And because people kept asking me and then I was always coached my son's uh, youth sports teams. And then once the parents got a chance to know me, they would ask me, well, because I would tell my boys, I'm like, listen, where I started and where I am now is two different places. Like, oh, yeah. you have to, you know, you're going to adjust over time. But just where you are today, if you're a poor student today, that don't mean you're a poor student ever. And I just never had any faith in our education system, right? Because of who I was and how I fit in the education system, the education system never accounted for anything I did outside of school. Yeah, Because if they did, they would have known that I was doing all of this technical stuff outside of school that was really way far advanced than what they were doing in school. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this book to kind of tell my story on there were some things that my mother did that she didn't know she did that helped me become an engineer. There was things my father did that he didn't know he was doing that mm -hmm. helped me become an engineer. And then, like, my path through school. Like, I had a troubled past in school. My mother was always in school for me, you know, acting up or whatever. And they kept trying to figure out, you know, when a kid, when a kid, I always tested off the charts, though. My New York State testing, I always tested off the charts. As an eighth grader coming out of middle school, I got expelled from school for fighting. And going into ninth grade, I had a meeting with the superintendent and they were looking to send me to alternative school. So the middle school administrators are in this meeting, it's me and my mother, and um, they're referring me to alternative school. The superintendent stops the meeting and said, anyone looked at Mr. Moore's New York State test record? Coming out of eighth grade, I was testing that 12th year, 10th month, and reading math and science, right? So I had virtually tested out of high school, out of eighth grade. So what they do with kids 
who test high and are poor students, well, maybe he's not being challenged. Exactly. Why are you going to give a kid more of something he don't want? Mm -hmm. So they would put me in the higher classes and I just wouldn't do that either. And one of the reasons I wouldn't do it because why? Like I was doing something else. So because I was I got in trouble and I was getting expelled from school, I had I had to talk to the psychologists and people. So one day um, I'm seeing I'm having a meeting with the psychologist and she was like, girl, you test all the charts. Like, what is it that we can do to help you do better in school? I said to the woman, I'll never forget this. I said, nobody ever asked me what I wanted to learn. Had anybody ever asked me, Gerald, what is it that you like? We're just force feeding kids stuff and it doesn't exactly. matter whether they mm -hmm. like it or not. We're not giving them anything that's relevant to their environment. I never had a black male educator ever. My whole K through 12, right? Never had a black male educator. And what I know, having been in the schools, when a white female approaches a young black male and me approaching that same young black male, there's a whole different dynamic going. It is. So another black man could approach me like, Gerald, calm it down. Do what I asked you to do. And it would have been a whole different ball game. But even to this day, black males make up less than 2% of our public school workforce. Yeah. Right? So where black boys are most suspended, dead last in every um, statistical category in reading math and science, right? Across the board, we graduated 50%. Out of that 50%, only 10% of us qualify to go into college and, and major in any of the um, higher engineering STEM fields, like engineering, computer science, um, and all of the new stuff, cyber that they have coming out. Like we don't even qualify for that stuff. But mm -hmm. yet, we're still not, you know, we know it makes a difference. Everybody knows that um, having black men in place matters. We know that it matters. Why are we still at 2%? True. Right? True. Why are we still at 2%? So we're talking, if I never had a black male educator, I interviewed a kid from California who's a part of my organization, and we were talking, and it came up. And I just asked him, have you ever had any black men educators? And he thought back. And he was like, no, I didn't. Right? And, and that's sad. So we're talking from when I came through school 30 years ago, and when this kid comes through school in 2020, we still don't have black men in the classrooms coaching black boys, and we're still trying to, to let predominantly white female educators educate black boys. It does not work. They have and, no clue who we are. And I mean, and you know what? That's across the board. I have, I have taught not only here, but other places. I just came back from teaching in Hawaii. Uh, I used to talk to our shop teacher all the time because at a, okay, at a middle school, this man had everything you would ever want. He had stuff for kids to do building, uh, uh, welding, pl plumbing, everything. And um, in Hawaii, they don't have high school technical programs. Like where I went to school at Trimble Tech, we we had medical, we had um, all of the trades, plumbing, electrical, welding, masonry, car, uh, auto body, auto mechanic, all of that at one school. And this so, is I the biggest school in Fort Worth, land mass wise. So I when went you to graduate, school like that. When you graduated from that school, you had a license to go straight to work in something. So and I went I, to a school called uh, Edison Tech, which mm -hmm. just like your vocational magnet school, we had all of those things. I went through the electrical program. Um, mm -hmm. And upon graduation of the electrical program, you had a couple of things to do. I wanted to go to college, but you could have rolled right into an electrical apprentice program. We had auto. My sister graduated from the same school. She got a cosmetology degree. She was a licensed yep. Um, cosmetologist. I had another friend. He went through the school. He he went into food service. He loved to cook. He became a chef. Like, you know, but those things, those types of magnet schools is what it was called. Uh, when I came through, you know, they, they don't exist. Yeah. Well, they, uh, I know every school in Fort Worth has a skill, but the children, the students make a choice. 
if they even want to go into one of those skills or not. Right. But we still have three technical high schools here that okay. kids can choose to go to, but a lot of them don't. A lot of them, uh, they just want to graduate. My mother didn't give us that choice. We didn't have that choice. When you graduated, you had to walk out of that school with a certification in something. For us, that wasn't a choice. And I was dental assistant. My sister was business administration. And my brother was, um, he did the, they have had like a civil engineering program. So we didn't have a choice. So interesting for me, had I not got kicked out of school, I wouldn't have gone to that school. See? So when I get kicked out of school, like I'm expelled. So the uh, the uh, superintendent's like, we're not kicking. We don't kick kids out of school who test off the charts like this. So he asked me, Mr. Moore, what school do you want to go to? So I had a couple of friends that was going to the tech school and you had to test to get in there. Yeah. Right. So I he was like, I said, I, I want to go to Edison Tech. And um, so I automatically got in like I <laughs> like I probably could have tested in. But because I got kicked out of school. I ended up in the vocational program where I took four years of, of electrical, right? And then I went on to get a degree in electronics engineering technology. Now, even though I was taking that vocation, I still wasn't like all of the other classes. And I still just wasn't a good student. I still just was not interested in the whole program. And, and just though I could do it, it just wasn't interesting. I was doing so much other stuff. Like I was, I was, I started DJing at like 15 years old. Right. <laughs> so I was heavy in the music. So I had, I started building my electronic studio. Like I was doing all of this other stuff. And when um, I look back on it, like I virtually created like my own education system. I read a lot. I just wasn't reading the stuff they wanted me to read in school. Yep. Like I read, I read there's a music book called This Business of Music, and it's actually used in law schools for um, people who go into law and they want to uh, be represented people in music. I read that book cover to cover as a 15 year old twice. Right. I read I was reading engineering books. My father would go to the store called Worldwide News where he would get his auto stuff. Yep. And I would sit in the corner and read electrical auto installation books in the corner for hours. Like when I, one of my friends, a good friend said to me one day, he said, we were, we were adults at the time. And he was like, man, we grew up. He was like in the same classes all the time. He was like, I did better than you. <laughs> most of most of the classes. He was like, how did you end up where you are? And I'm still shooting this screw in the side of a box at this factory. And I said to him, I said, it's a lot of what you guys didn't know when I left the hood, right? I got a car at 16 years old, cheap car, paid like uh, my mother, uh, my father's sister, husband had a business and he had a company car and he needed to get rid of it. It was like a Chevy Chevette. Mm -hmm. And uh, I bought the car from him for like $300. <laughs> Love that car. What I would do, I grew up in Rochester, New York, and Rochester, New York sits on Lake Ontario. Yep. So on Saturday mornings, get up, I would go out to the beach and read. I would do this often. Anytime, you know, I'm, I'm tired of being in the hood, I would go out to the beach and read. So I told him, I was like, you know, I used to go out to the beach and read. And I was like, you know, it wasn't something that I talked about because that's not what we talked about in the hood. We talked about tough stuff. We talked about, you know, and you guys knew me as an athlete, and all of that stuff. This additional thing that I was interested in just kind of didn't fit where we was growing up. And he said to me, I wish you would have taken me. I wish you would have taken me. And I think that we have a lot of young black males who don't get the yeah. opportunity to explore what their true passions are because they're trapped in a situation that they think they can't get out of and they're portraying an image that's really not them. Like a lot of me growing up, I was portraying an image of this tough guy who would fight. And I did that so I wouldn't have to fight. Yep. Right? Because I had this tough image and I was a good athlete, I didn't have to fight. Where 
a lot of kids struggled, you know, being in that, you know, good student mode because they would get challenged and bullied all the time. Oh, yeah. So I just took the other side and said, okay, I'm not going to get bullied and I'm going to have to do what I have to do. But at the same time, I had this thing in me to build and design and create that just didn't go with my neighborhood. And those are the kids we're trying to find in Mission Fulfilled to let mm-hmm. them know tech is cool. Like, I am STEM. Like, I'm what a, you know, people, I talk to people all the time and, um, you know, people would be like, you don't, you don't talk like an engineer. Like, you don't do things engineers do because they assume <laughs> the engineer is just going to be quiet and sit in the corner and be to himself. Well, I'm very outgoing. I'm very, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just out there. I'm loud. Um, you know, and I, I don't talk about it all the time. Right. And, and because I want other people to be interested in it, I never talk in jargon. Like, I'm, I'm a cybersecurity engineer, and I could talk about all the cyber words and terms like that, but I can't, I can't draw people to it if I'm explaining yep. it like that. Right? And mm-hmm. that, that was one of the reasons I was successful in corporate because I could take all the jargon and, and chomp it down into, into the where the layperson could understand. Yeah. So as a federal government contractor, I was good at that. So I ended up getting an opportunity to lead a lot of meetings and grow my career just because I could break down the technology and put it in the terms that people could understand. Mm-hmm. And you know what? That is important. The, the, the conversation, the communication is huge. Because that's a lot. That's one of the things that we we are afraid of. We're afraid of not looking as though we know what we're talking about. Right. And we have to stop that. We right. have to stop it. Now, uh, I want to transition to mission fulfilled. Um, and you've already alluded to what your goal and your vision is. Who do you work with? What are the ages of young men that you work with? And what are some of the things that you're doing right now with them? We're trying to capture kids from eight to eighteen, because okay. if you look, if you look ten years out, our eight-year-olds are our next workforce. Mm-hmm. So we got to work on them now. We got we can't wait until they get to be juniors in high school and they're wondering, well, I don't know what I can do. And then they got the teachers telling them, well, you can't go into engineering because your GPA isn't such. You haven't taken calculus and you haven't done all this. Well, that's not even important, right? That's not even important. So we're working from kids from eight to eighteen. And then we also have an extended program where we're working with post-secondary kids who are not going to college to help them get certifications. So we have a partnership with CompTIA, which is one of the foremost um, IT certification bodies in the world. And we have an IT IT fundamentals program and an A-plus program. And we're hopefully looking to launch a cyber pathways program, which is what we call the new opportunities for black boys, which Mm -hmm. will take black boys through a two-year program and get them four certifications and either put them on a cybersecurity path, a software development path, a cloud infrastructure path, and give them the opportunity to actually be successful in tech and STEM without going to college. Um, Through our IT fundamentals program, there are a lot of companies that we're looking to partner with and get internships for kids who come through this program because the IT fundamentals certification qualifies a kid to get in an entry-level help desk tier, what we call a tier three help desk position, right? Which is an entry-level position. Um, Where I'm from in Rochester, New York, the average household income is about $35,000 right now. A kid with the IT fundamental certification can start his career at that level at about $35,000 to $55,000, depending on where you are in the country. If you're in DC, California, um, Chicago, where the, the pay is a little higher, we're talking about getting kids the opportunity to to do what is virtually their apprenticeship program mm-hmm. to get into tech and STEM, where they wouldn't qualify to get into computer science or engineering in college. Right. So then we can take them through a certification path and the majority, like probably 95% of our tech companies, they actually pay for kids to go to school. So we can take a kid, get them certified, get them certifications, get them working for a company and then the company will pay for them to go back to school. And it kind of looks like this, like a kid comes through, he has a couple certifications, he has his IT fundamental certification, he has his A plus certification, he's working for a company and they come back to him, Gerald, you're doing a pretty good job, but in order to get on the management side, 
we need you to get some college. Well, now I have a more mature young man, right? Mm -hmm. At 18, black boys, we tend to mature a little later than our females, but now we can get into an opportunity. The opportunity is helping us to grow, and now we can see a better value of college and how that works. And now we have some IT behind us. Now we can actually get into the programs we want to get into and then still come out with no debt. Yeah, so, and that's what I was going to say. You have some funding behind you. Either the company may be paying a portion of it or you're able to pay a course right. at a time because you're making uh, you're making good money or you're making, right. you know, Absolutely. you're making money that you can do it with. And when we look at how that pot potentially impacts the black community and the black family, mm -hmm. you know, that's a much better opportunity than the school to prison pipeline. That's a oh, much yeah. better. That's a much better opportunity than school to McDonald's, where black boys not going to work that job. You know, yeah. we're not going to work that job because there's no sense of pride in it. So if we can get our young black men certifications, and the goal is is to start training our boys at eight years old towards these certifications and these skills, and one of the huge things that we do is we're led by black men in the field. Mm -hmm. So where our black boys are not getting um, black male educators in school, we're providing black male educators out of school. And uh, one of our signature programs for our younger kids is our youth tech entrepreneurs program. And through this I program, I was going to ask you about that. Through this program, what we want to do is help our boys explore the various disciplines in technology, whether it be coding, whether it be UX UI design whether it be cyber, whether it be artificial intelligence, internet of things, kind of give them exposure to a little bit of everything because we don't know what they want to go to. We don't know what their aptitudes are. So a lot of schools are focusing on coding, 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 coding. My son exactly. is in a graphic design. He could care less about coding. So does he not, you know, so those kids that are into the arts, how are they being impacted by you only offering coding? Right, if that's your only only offer. So through our Youth Tech Entrepreneurs Program, we teach the kids how to build their own website, build their own app, leverage um, social media marketing and business strategy to create a product. So once we once you learn all of those things and you put it together and you put your product out to market, you virtually have your own software company. Mm -hmm. So once we teach these kids how to take an idea to market, once you do it once, now every idea you have, you now know how to put that together and create the systems necessary to create your own business. And that's another thing that we're really huge on. Instead of being consumers of technology, we want to create producers of technology. And we, we do are that major with kids. consumers. Yeah, and we do that with kids starting at eight years old because we all know, all kids know what merch is, right? Merch is a big thing with kids on, on social media. So we teach kids how to design and create their own merch, leverage free tools and softwares to kind of make their own site, make their own app. And then we teach them how to use social media appropriately instead of using social media as a toy, using social media as a business tool. Yeah. So by teaching these kids this very young, even if they don't go into tech and STEM, they know how to ideate and innovate and put these tools together to create businesses. And I think that um, this is going to go well for us into the future and just impacting these kids with the ability to create, mm -hmm. right? Because a lot of our kids, our kids are, in 10 years, we're going to have a gig economy. Nobody may be employed oh, yeah. where we're going. So it's going to be, what skills do you have? What can you do? So by teaching kids how to use a bunch of different tools so they're not locked in, unlocking their imagination to anything you think of, you can actually create into a product and put out to market because right now I would say with black people as a whole we don't get funded like other people get no funded. we don't right yeah. so we have to learn to one leverage existing tools that can help us mm -hmm. then leverage each other mm -hmm. so imagine what this looks like in the future mission fulfill impacts a hundred thousand boys and we have a hundred thousand boys in our in our membership not only do we have 100,000 boys, we have 100,000 boys with all different types of skills under one umbrella. Yeah. So now when we're talking about funding something, 
we got a hundred thousand strong to fund our own. Oh yeah. Right. So that's the vision. The vision is to empower these boys and then in the future bring that back to the black family. I mean, even if they're only giving one dollar, one dollar from a hundred thousand boys is a hundred thousand dollars. And the thing that you're the thing that you're changing that I'm seeing is uh giving those kids the vision of not you know when they graduate they've got something right that they that they can do how many years have you been doing this so far so we we went um i founded the nonprofit so mission fulfilled actually kicked off i launched the tech school for black boys end of like 2017 mm-hmm. right and that was a fee for service program and because I was still working at the time, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So I just launched that because I have sons and I wanted to get my basketball team involved with something. So I kind of launched that. But then what I realized was, Gerald, think about where you came from and how many kids from where you come from would have been able to participate in this program. And I didn't want to be exclusionary from my people. Mm-hmm. So when... um I met Sean Dove and Sean Dove runs this organization called the campaign for black male achievement. Mm -hmm. And I met him through the uh, black enterprise, modern men and um, at the black men Excel conference and having an opportunity to speak with, with Sean, Sean said to me, man, I love what you're doing. Keep Mm -hmm. doing it. Have you ever thought about taking this to the nonprofit space? And I had thought about it, but I didn't really at the time want to go through the work to do it. (laughs) <laughs> but what I knew is I knew that I want I didn't want to do something that was exclusive to black boys who come from where I come from who wouldn't be able to afford this type of program so in 2019 I launched Mission Fulfilled uh, 2030 we got our 501c3 in October 2019 so we're legitimately just a year and a half in and uh, we've done some really awesome stuff in that time um, when COVID first hit we yeah. launched a free um, intro to computer science program that reached 500 boys internationally, had kids in Africa in this program, the UK, Canada. Um, and that just kind of kicked it off where in my head I was like, all right, Gerald, you're on to something that's just bigger than where you are located in the D.C. metro area. So then I started doing some research and I realized there's not one national fully funded tech and STEM program for black boys. There's like five for black girls with black girls code being the leader. Oh, there are more than five I've had. I don't even know how many on this show. Right. But But that are national fully funded programs. Oh yeah. National fully funded programs. Right. Mm -hmm. There's not one nationally fully funded program for black boys in tech and STEM. Wow. So I'm like, so I'm like, all right, Gerald, Maybe that's you. Maybe that's your calling. Maybe that's your calling. And even if, even if, even if there is, right? Like you said, how many are there for girls? We need more than one. Oh yeah. We got we to. need more than one. And it's it's unfortunate at this stage that black boys in the plight where we are today are being overlooked mm-hmm. in this field. And it's really hard. It's really hard to get funding for black males. Like yeah. it's really hard to get funding. And I'm I'm surprised at how hard it is to get funding con- considering where we are, right? Where black males are dead last um, in national state testing from state to state. Black males at birth have a 28.5% chance of going to state and federal pr- prison in their lifetime. Like, that's insane. And, you know, here in the state of Texas, guess what age they make that decision on how many prisons they need to build? Third grade. Third. Ah, third grade. Must be the same there. Third, third grade. grade. There's a national stat old. that prisons are built based on the reading scores of black boys in third grade. Um, there's, a, there's a gentleman named Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu. Yep. He wrote a series of books called A Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. And all of that data, like he wrote these books 20 years ago. Yep. Everything is consistent. Everything Mm -hmm. is consistent with today. 
And, um, you know, it's, it's programs like Mission Fulfilled that have to make the change. It's not going to be um, change within our systems and our public school systems. That's not what they're designed to do because prison is a business. Mm -hmm. Right? Prison is a business and they've done well filling prisons with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, you know, the thing that I thoroughly enjoy about this conversation is not so much of the fact that every kid has to go to college and be an engineer. It's, it's giving that gradual movement, you know, go to a technical school, you know, learn how to uh, code, learn how to be a welder, learn how to be a plumber and uh, learn cybersecurity. All of those things are going to make you want to do better. Right. And again, for our black boys, right, I always tell people, like, depending on where you're from, in the inner city where I'm from, and I'm pretty sure it's like this in most um, low-income areas in Texas, NFL, mm -hmm. NBA, mm -hmm. uh, drugs. Mm -hmm. That's how you believe you make it out. Because that's what's portrayed to us. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what's portrayed to us. Like, I was a good athlete. I was in the music. Like, I did all those things. Some of my best friends I grew up with were drug dealers, right? I did all of those things. But at the end of the day, right, we should be able to explore all of those options but not leave the option out of being technically skilled. Yes. So because I think sports breeds discipline. It does. And that's where most of our black boys have positive black men in their lives is through sports. And you go so, to any school around here, you're going to see black coaches, uh, but you may not see black teachers. Right. I mean, I was lucky. My English teacher was a black male in high school, and this was in the 70s. My science teacher, who really was the one, I mean, other than my mother allowing me to do all the things I did, he was the one who got me into biology. He honed in my skill, coach levels, and I talk about him all the time. Uh, because I didn't want to do English. We had an English teacher that was black. But my thing, I was a skills person. But we have about four minutes left. This has been such a great conversation. Um, you know, give me a little bit about what you've got coming up. Uh, and I forgot to ask you this because we've been talking. Let people know how to contact you, how to follow you. What's your website? What, you know, all of that stuff. Instagram, right. tweet, Twitter. You can, you can tell I'm older because I'm talking about tweet it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to run it all down. So again, people, if you want to reach out to me, I'm Gerald A. Moore Sr. And you can find me at missionfulfilled2030.org. Just go to our website, hit the contact, you can get to me. Um, we are also on Instagram at, at Mission Fulfilled 2030. We are on Facebook at Mission Fulfilled 2030. On Twitter, we are Mission F. 2030 mission f 2030 on twitter um if you're interested in getting my book you can go to motivateblackboys.com where you can get the signed copy the book is always is on amazon as well i'm an amazon best-selling author uh the book has been in the amazon top 100 for over a year now it's an awesome book i'm getting great feedback for it it's your guide to get your young black male from the hood to doing good and a six-figure salary by the time he's 24, 25 years old with his tech skills. So motivate black boys, you can also get to me. I am also on Instagram at Gerald Moore Unplugged because I do a whole lot of other things that you know that are outside of Mission Fulfilled. But the 10,000 Black Boys Initiative, we are launching in the next two weeks, the 10,000 Black Boys Initiative. And what we're going to do there, we're looking to get our next 10,000 Black Boys into Mission Fulfilled so they can learn to be young men and gain technical skills for the future. Our goal is to impact 100,000 Black Boys in the next 10 years. So we're launching our first 10,000 Black Boys Initiative, and you can find out more from that at missionfulfilled2030.org. Get on the email list and also please, please support young black males. Hit the donate button. Every donation counts 
and we're doing amazing work and we're looking to make this a national organization. So the support of the people is necessary because at the end of the day, one of the primary reasons I'm doing this, I have three daughters. The chances that my daughters can marry a man in the mold of their father is about 2%. And that's what keeps me up at night. And I know it keeps a, a, a lot of other people. And in order to build the black family, we have to have capable black men. So I am building young men, young boys into black men so they're capable so we can strengthen the black family. At the end of the day, that's the goal. Thank you. Okay. Trenton is uh, keeps sending me these messages. I love you, Trenton, my producer, because he's over <laughs> at the stadium, and I need him to be safe. So he's got a show that's coming on after us, uh, Glory Rising, and... Um, so I have to do what he tells me to do, even if I'm not in the building. Yes. But hey, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Do not let this be your last uh, visit. Although I will be taking a break over the summer because I just want to take a break and we'll be back uh, coming back up. Anytime you need me, you let me know. And hey, same here. Anytime you need me or uh, I have a son who is an audio engineer and he does a lot of movies and television. If you ever need a speaker, he is awesome. I need him for audio visual. Connect okay. me, please. Okay, I'm going to connect y'all. I'm going to definitely connect you. But, uh, Gerald, I want to thank you for coming on.